Prior to 2020, unless you're a maritime history buff, you probably didn't think too much about what happened to a cruise ship when it retired from service. Decades of growth in the industry has kept cruise ships in service for unprecedented lengths of time, with most of the focus on fancy new ships rather than the aging cruise ships at the end of their career. But this year, everything has changed, and we've seen numerous popular cruise ships making unexpected final journeys to the scrapyard. I'm Chris Frame, and today we're going to be looking at ship recycling. Ships have been scrapped and recycled for about as long as ships have existed. And just like building demolition on land, or aircraft demolition, which we've seen quite a lot of this year, it can be a very dangerous process and requires skill to be successfully undertaken. Scrapping a ship allows materials such as steel, aluminium, glass and the like to be extracted, reused and repurposed. This has led to terms like it's being turned into razor blades to become a common slang for a ship that's headed to scrap. For the most part, ships are withdrawn from service as newer vessels come online to replace them. This is a gradual process with some ships being retained longer than others due to high demand or delays in the construction of their replacements. Most ships that have existed have ended their days in the scrapyard and this includes some of the most famous ships that the world has ever seen. In the 1930s, Cunard's record-breaking express liner Mauritania, holder of the transatlantic speed record from 1909 to 1929, was scrapped, as was the White Star Line's Olympic, sister of the ill-fated Titanic, and heralded in 1911 as being the largest and most luxurious liner in the world. The French liner Liberty, formerly Norddeutsche Loi's record-breaking Europa, was scrapped in the 1960s. So too was Britannic, the last White Star liner in service. And even ships that had proudly served their nations in world wars ended up in the scrapyards. Perhaps the most notable example of this was Cunard's Aquitania, which served proudly in both World War I and World War II. Yet in 1950, she was scrapped at a yard in Scotland. In the 1960s, as jet aircraft made passenger ships obsolete, many ocean liners were sent to the scrapyard for dismantling. This includes P&O's Orchides, Oronce and or Sova, as well as many ships of the Union Castle Line, French Line and the Cunard Line. While scrap is a common fate for most ships, in recent years cruise ships have been kept in service for longer and longer, thanks to the unprecedented global cruising boom that we've experienced over the past few decades. This isn't to say that ships haven't been broken up during this time, with some pretty notable ships having been sent to scrap. This includes the SS Norway, the Pacific Princess, better known as the Love Boat, uh, and also other ships that were famous in local waters, such as P&O's Pacific Sky, all ending up in scrapyards over the last few decades. But for many cruise ships, the growth of cruising has extended their service life. Ships that were designed as premier liners for big brands such as Carnival Cruise Lines, Royal Caribbean and Princess Cruises have found second lives, and sometimes even third or fourth lives, with smaller brands such as Pumantua, CMV and even Fred Olsen. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought this growth of cruising to a grinding halt, with most of the world's cruise ships currently in a state of warm layup in oceans around the world. You can check out my video about the ships in warm layup at the moment in the info card or in the description below. This has led to some cruise lines such as Pumantua and CMV ending operations while other brands such as Carnival, Costa, P&O and Holland America have been forced to reduce their fleet in an attempt to stem the losses. While some ships, including Holland America's Amsterdam and Rotterdam, have been sold for future use as cruise ships, others have been less lucky. Costa Victoria, Carnival Fantasy, Carnival Inspiration and Pulmunta's Sovereign and Monarch have all been sold for scrap in recent months, with the latter four vessels all heading to the same Turkish scrapyard. Generally, when a ship is sold for scrap, it is formally withdrawn from passenger service and the ship is prepared for the final voyage to the scrapyard. This process often includes removing valuable items from on board the ship in a process known as de-storing. In days gone by, this was often an orderly and well planned out process. A good example being in 1997, when the P&O liner Canberra was withdrawn from service. Alongside in Southampton, the ship was de-stored with items such as valuable P&O memorabilia artworks, signage and other onboard trinkets of particular value removed from the ship. 
It might surprise you though that the majority of things that are on board the ship when it's withdrawn from service go with the ship to the scrapyard. This includes all sorts of things, from beds to dining tables to chairs to lounges, lighting and carpets, all left on board and either unsold or recycled by the scrapyard. Sometimes entire sections of a ship can be saved during the scrapping process and used again. This was certainly the case with White Star Lines Olympic, where panelling, ceiling decoration and other fixtures from the ship's interior were reused at the White Swan Hotel in England while other parts of the interior can be found on display at the Sea City Museum in Southampton. While ships like Canberra, Big Red Boat 2, Carnival Fantasy, Carnival Inspiration, Sovereign and Monarch sailed to the scrapyard wearing their original name and livery. In some cases, ships bound for the scrapyard may be renamed and debranded for their final voyage. For example, the SS Norway was renamed before she made her final journey to the beaches of Alang in India. While the current media attention on scrapping ships has shown some dramatic footage of large cruise ships being driven up onto the beaches under their own power, this form of scrapping isn't always the way it's done. Norway, for example, was taken under tow owing to her engines being unserviceable after an onboard explosion, which was actually the cause of her exit from service. More recently, this was seen with the Costa Concordia. Having been partially refloated, the ship was towed to Genoa in Italy where she was dismantled. Sometimes the scrapping process commences while the ship is still in the water, as was the case with the Olympic, which had its superstructure dismantled in Jarrow, England, while the hull was towed to Scotland for final dismantling. Scrapping a ship on site is also an option. To remove a damaged or sunken ship where refloating it and towing it away is not an option. A well-known example of this is the former ocean liner Queen Elizabeth that caught fire in 1972 and sunk in Hong Kong Harbour while being converted into a floating university. Between 1974 and 1975, parts of the ship were scrapped on site. The precise scrapping process differs depending on the ship and the scrapyard where it is being dismantled. Some ships are harder to scrap than others, which can make the process very drawn out, as was the case with Canberra. Some scrapyards will commence the process with a ceremonial cutting of the bow, which we've seen recently on board the Monarch in Turkey. This also happened with Norway at Alang, and the tip of her bow has been preserved in Paris as a monument to her original career as the SS France. The concept of recycling a ship isn't just limited to the entire scrapping of a vessel. In fact, many ships are given large-scale refurbishments which produce a lot of scrap metal, and this metal is recycled for further use. A good example of this is QE2, which between 1986 and 1987 was converted, from steam power to diesel electric. The re-engining process resulted in 4,700 tonnes of scrap, including the ship's original steam turbines, boilers and even the propellers. One of those propellers was actually directly recycled into sets of golf clubs. When the ship returned to service, these golf clubs were brought on board and sold in the gift shop at a premium. Another thing to note is that during the refurbishment process, many items on board a ship are replaced. Collectors can purchase items from the scrapyard if a ship is being completely scrapped or from the shipyard if a ship is being refurbished. Some of these items do make their way back into museums which gives us a glimpse into how ships looked during various periods of their careers. In rare cases, some passenger ships are preserved for the long term. Notable examples of large preserved passenger ships include the SS Rotterdam, the RMS Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth II all of which have been converted into floating hotels and museums. This is definitely the exception to the rule. And as I mentioned before, most passenger ships that have existed have ended up being scrapped. In fact, there are more pyramids that you can visit today than there are original preserved ocean liners. Preserving a ship in a stationary manner is an expensive process and requires a great deal of insight and funds to make it a successful venture. Even in these cases, the ships are often refurbished with original items being removed from the ship, unsold, recycled, and in some cases scrapped. A good example is the RMS Queen Mary. When she was converted into a hotel ship, her original funnels were removed from the ship and new ones were put in their place. The metal from those original funnels was recycled and scrapped. I hope this video gave you some insight as to how and why ships are scrapped. If you found the video interesting, please give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I would like to send out a huge thank you to Peter Canego of MidshipCentury.com. Peter is one of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to the topic of scrapping ships. 
and he has a fantastic series of DVDs as well as an informative website which you can find in the link in the description below. I'd also like to send my thanks to Andrew Sassoli Walker, a Southampton based photographer who provides me with access to his fantastic imagery of cruise ships based in Southampton. And also my thanks to Rob Henderson and Doug Kramer for access to their fantastic Henderson and Kramer collection. I've linked to both in the description below. If you're interested in what else is happening in the cruising world at the moment, check out my cruise news playlist. Or if you're more interested in maritime history and the great stories of ocean liners of days gone by, take a look at my maritime history playlist. Thanks again for watching and until next time, I hope to see you on board.